Good evening. Welcome to Old St. Mary's Church as we celebrate the Eucharist on this, the third Sunday of Lent. I'm Leslie, and Scott and I will lead the music this evening. While only the cantor is able to sing during this phase of reopening the church, the music and readings for this Mass can be found in this week's worship aid. Feel free to follow along on your phone or device if you'd like. Just click the Sunday Worship Aid link on the front page of our parish website, oldstmarys.com. Presiding and preaching at this liturgy is Father Wilson Smith. Our gathering song is From Ashes to the Living Font. Sisters, that I have to sin in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. reading from the book of Exodus. In those days, 
God delivered all these commandments. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. You shall not have other gods besides me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave unpunished the one who takes his name in vain. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, that you may have a long life in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male or female slave, nor his ox or ass, nor anything else that belongs to him. The Word of the Lord.
Reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the many money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and the oxen, and spilled the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Take these out of here, and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of Scripture, Zeal for your house will consume me. At this the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. The Gospel of the Lord. I don't want to reduce God down to some brand of holy rock star, though I'd say that if he were one, he would, of course, be the best that there is. And if that's the case, the Ten Commandments are one of his greatest hits. When we talk about God, you know, even with people who don't believe in God, this is one of the things that I think God is best known for. Oh, God, right, that supreme being who orders you around and he tells you all what to do and stuff. He set the tree on fire. He talked through it. He's got that big, booming voice in the Charlton Heston movie. I am the Lord, your God. It's not bad. I'm available. (laughs) And I always say, you know, yeah, it was cool of God to do that cameo, wasn't it? Because, you know, you would think he'd be very busy. I think there's a kind of, though, 
unfortunate, if you will, characterization of God out there that has emerged from the commandments, or at least how they've been interpreted over time. God is seen as, you know, sort of arbitrarily bossy, maybe even petty. Or maybe we get incomplete ideas about what it means to be religiously devoted, as though it's just about checking certain boxes. We might begin to revise our understanding, though, if we attend to what Jesus replies to as the greatest commandments. You know, he's asked that question, which are the greatest commandments? And his hearers would recognize this from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that word, we just heard it twice in relation to the commandments, love. That's what it all comes back to. The commandments train us how to love. We follow the commandments, we hold them with reverence until these things become second nature to us and even things that we desire for their own sake and we like them. In this way, we become more like God whose very essence, the letter, first letter of John tells us, his very essence is love, God is love. Now, I'd love to do a rundown of all the Ten Commandments. Wouldn't that be fun? Or maybe I could do like a top ten list of my favorites. It's not audacious at all, right? There'd be nothing wrong with that. But for today, I'll just continue with one um, that I think is oft neglected, perhaps because we take its meaning to be so plain and so obvious, and yet I would say it's one that has some of the highest stakes when it comes to how we love God and our neighbor and that is taking the Lord's name in vain, right? You shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? I'm doing the voice again, trying to do the voice again, all right? It's sort of a bit now. So for many of us, our parents have probably been some of our first catechists on this one. You know, we stub our toe for the first time, or we spill some milk, we make a mistake. We do something regrettable that may upset us, for a moment, and then certain even more regrettable words reflexively emerge from our mouths. I shall not repeat them here, of course, but some of the classic replacement expressions include, oh my gosh, that's a famous one, Jiminy Christmas, right? That's not good because that's a little, that's no good. Or my personal favorite, because it's not even close to being the Lord's name in vain, heavens to Betsy. Right? I've been saying that one for years. What does it mean? No idea. I'm going to keep saying it anyway. Right? So some of our more pedantic siblings will be quick to point out that in terms of the whole linguistic philosophy of the issue, some of what we call taking the Lord's name in vain is really no different from just saying the Lord's name, surely. You know, and on paper, okay, I guess that's true. It's the same words. Um, my mother, God rest her, was not pedantic, um, but like the rest of her Irish family for generations, she would sometimes use the phrase, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, in moments of severe frustration or exhaustion, especially on the road. You know, and, and again, on paper, this is fine. And I can fondly remember as kids taking the road trip back to Montreal, her hometown, uh, in the summer, we're looking out the window there, lovely trees. We got some, some gentle, a little bit of Joni Mitchell on the AM radio. Everything's chill. Mom's humming, humming along. And then some car speeds up and cuts her off. And she says, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, right? And now I was scandalized by this as a young boy, right? And I, I would be like, Mom, you're not supposed to say that, okay? Ten years old. What a loser, right? What am I, I'm, I'm correcting my own mother and then like offer to hear a confession or something, you know, like saying, we can fix this. Um, so, you know, that's what I say. And she was, you know, a very gentle, sweet, devoted Catholic who probably, honestly, I don't think ever uttered a curse word in her entire life. She'd reacted as though it never occurred to her that, that this would be taking the Lord's name in vain because in her mind, she is merely invoking the heavenly assistance of the Holy Family. There just happened to be a little bit of stank on it, right? But more or less, that was, that was her intent. So my confession now. I draw all this out. I tell you this little story. And this sense of taking the Lord's name in vain, this plainer sense of it, because I think it's important that we grasp kind of how superficial 
and sometimes even petty, I'm afraid to say, this sense of using the Lord's name in vain can be, and, and even how subjective it is. Okay, it's something we can judge each other on, but we really shouldn't. Now, I'm not, obviously not saying we should do it. We absolutely should not. Think of how we treat holy and sacred spaces like this one. You know, we bless them, we, we are appropriately silent, and we adorn them appropriately. Uh, we're respectful. The name of the Lord is worthy, above all other names, to have that kind of respect and humility towards it. But where I think we risk missing the point of this commandment is if all of our attention is on the offensiveness of the language alone and not all the ways that the name of the Lord is used for ungodly, sometimes nefarious things. And this is really important, right? In 2 Corinthians, Paul says we are ambassadors for Christ. We're an image of God to the world. People come to know God through our words, our actions, and our lives. So how we use the name of the Lord, that really matters big time. So the Hebrew word that we render as vain, that can mean empty, it can mean worthless, it can mean void, it can also mean to no good purpose. So I think there's plenty of examples, right, that we can maybe conceive of, of this sense of vainness, where God's name is used for something harmful or bad. But I'd like to draw out one instance that weighs very heavy, very often on my mind and heart, especially, you know, as someone who joined the polis with a mind towards the peripheries, people who feel or, or seem marginalized in some way. So, you know, over the course of my time in ministry, I have felt very humbled and very privileged to meet God's people of various ages who have entrusted me with their truth or the truth that they're only recently uncovering, that they are gay, that they are lesbian, that they are maybe bisexual. And I've been humbled still to have encounters with others who are working out their gender identity or are confused by that. You know, and these are people, again, my friends, that I consider my friends, people whom I love and care for. Um, but then there are still others who have settled those questions a long time ago right, and are simply trying to work out and struggle through, as Catholics, how to be in a church that so often feels hostile to them. Now, some people have a, a knee-jerk reaction to that word, hostile, in the church, and maybe feel defensive, you know, and we can say, hey, now the catechism says that LGBTQ people are to be treated with respect and compassion and sensitivity and that discrimination in their regard, all discrimination, should be avoided. The church is not homophobic. We're not transphobic. And to that, I observe, like taking the Lord's name in vain in the traditional sense, that looks decent on paper, right? It's true. That's what the catechism says. It's true. Respect, compassion, sensitivity, all discrimination to be avoided. The lived reality is something quite different, right? If we're listening, if we're attentive, the lived reality is quite different. Instead, it's often something ungodly, the Lord's name being used for something ungodly. So, you know, as an example, recently the Equality Act was passed. This was a bill which would ensure protections against discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity over a variety of critical areas, housing, employment, credit, civil duties, public services. And the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the USCCB, they responded, you know, just as disapprovingly in the passing of this bill as they did in the lead-up to it. They gave a statement that was, to borrow from the commandments, vain. That is to say, void, null, empty, of any loving sentiment whatsoever for LGBTQ people. Nor did it express any awareness whatsoever of the LGBTQ Catholics who faithfully worship in our pews, on Zoom, who serve in every area of parish life and beyond, including in the religious life and in the priesthood. Catholics who love their God with their whole heart, their whole soul, their whole mind. 
and who love their neighbors, as I have seen time and time again, as themselves, even as it may be that some of those neighbors, as the USCCB statement, I think, represents, would reject and discriminate against them if they only knew, and some even if they know. So while that anti-LGBTQ sentiment, of course, exists pervasively uh, and toxically among families and systems, I really feel compelled to acknowledge forcefully how strongly it has and continues to exist among clergy and the upper echelons of our hierarchy. You know, and the more I read statements like that that I just mentioned recently, and the more I hear and sit with the young LGBTQ person in front of me, one after another, ponder why their church hates them so much, ponder how they can find their own place in the Catholic community, and even ponder heartbreakingly, why does God not love them? I want to march to the USCCB headquarters in Washington, and I want to turn some tables over. I really do. Just as Jesus did in the gospel today, I want to turn the tables, and I want to shake them, and I want to shout at them. Why have you not learned to love? I want to scream at these men who are supposed to be shepherds on behalf of every broken heart that has time and again broken my heart. But I know too that it's not, you know, none of these issues are ever about just one removed organization that's apart from me, right? I never want to be self-righteous about this because I'm I have a stake, I have a claim, I have a part of it. You know, just speaking more directly to our LGBTQ siblings, here on Zoom, wherever you are, I am so deeply sorry for ways that our church has failed you. Times when we purport to be speaking in the name of the Lord, when we've really taken that name in vain, by speaking from fear, and from ignorance, or fear of what it means that we're ignorant. The church has so many tears and so much blood on our hands. And this being the season of Lent that it is, now is a right and just time for bishops, priests, and all Catholics who have taken the Lord's name in vain and done damage to LGBTQ people to repent and believe in the gospel. I pray some manner of how I and other leaders commit to live and to pastor from now on will constitute a more substantive and meaningful apology. Whether you are young or old, the Paulist Fathers, including myself and the people here at Old St. Mary's, we are your family in the Lord. And I, for one, do not have, I don't have every answer. I don't have it all figured out, right? But I can promise to walk with you and to love you unconditionally, unconditionally. I commit, even as I exhort all those to whom this applies, in other words, to follow the commandments reverently. And all the more closely this Lenten season and beyond, to every place and to every person that has had hate spoken to them, to go into those places and speak a word of love. Speak the name of the holy name of God, our Lord, the author of all that is good, true, holy, and loving. May we speak that name to you and to one another for now and forever. Amen.
Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? This is our faith, the faith of the Church. We're proud to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, friends, we lift our voices in this holy place, praying that God will hear us and be present to those who are in need. For the Church, may we always be consumed with zeal for the house of the Lord, we pray. For the peoples of the world, May the voice of the poor, the weak, and the powerless be heard and respected, we pray. As Pope Francis continues his eagerly awaited and historic visit to Iraq, bless his efforts to promote dialogue, reconciliation, and peace, we pray. For those preparing to enter the Catholic Church at Easter, may they accept their own crosses and find in that experience the presence of the Lord, we pray. May we learn that the fullness of life and love can be experienced only through love of God and love of neighbor, we pray. May the sick experience a wellspring of healing and comfort, we pray. May all who have died, especially David O'Connor, be welcomed into the house of the Lord, we pray. For the intentions we hold in silence. We pray. Hear us, so God of faithfulness and love. Your law is perfect, refreshing the sinner. Bring your healing love to our broken world. Inspire us to live as witnesses to your gospel. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, because we're not able to gather your financial offerings in the usual way, we ask you to please drop them in one of the metal boxes that's mounted on the wall over near the baptismal font as you depart today. Those of you joining us from home can mail in your contributions to the parish office or donate online by clicking on the donate button on the parish website. As always, we thank you for your generosity in support of the ministry at Old St. Mary's. Come, O oh God, renew your people, we who long to see your face. Strengthen hearts that have grown our lives with truth and grace. Only you can win our freedom. Only you can bring us peace. Only in the cross of Jesus will the captives find release. In create a new heart, melt away the winter chill. Help us now to make a new start. Help us now to know your will. Washed in waters of forgiveness, cleansed in waters of new birth. Lead us to the cross of Jesus, bringing life to all the earth. May the Lord accept this sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good. Sacrificial offerings, and grant that we who receive pardon for our own sins may take care of 
it is right and just.
Uh, just a reminder, everyone, the ushers will come along and uh, help you. They'll spray your hands with hand sanitizer, so please rub that in thoroughly. And we want to remain socially distant, six feet apart, as we line up for communion. When you do receive, please keep your mask on and receive at this time in your hand only. And then step aside to one of the yellow decal stickers on the floor, lower one side of your mask, and then receive the host. Thank you so much.
As we receive the pledge of things he had hidden in heaven and are nourished while still on earth with the bread that comes from on high, we humbly entreat you, O Lord, that what is being brought about us in mystery may come true to completion through Christ our Lord. Uh, thank you, first of all, to whoever brought this battery for my microphone. I don't know who did that. Thank you. That one of you. Oh, sure. You're great. Sorry, it doesn't, you know, I have bad luck sometimes. I don't like to shout at you, you know, but it's just, uh, you know, doing my best here. Uh, thank you, as always, for joining us in prayer and in worship today. Let's keep praying for and with one another uh, here and uh, those of you online. The Stations of the Cross are still being prayed virtually via Zoom at 6 p.m. on each of the Fridays in Lent. Details about stations, as well as a link to a variety of Lenten resources, can be found in the weekly bulletin at oldstmarys.com. Uh, Old, Old St. Mary's is again participating in the CRS Rice Bowl. That's Catholic Relief Services Lenten program. You're invited to take a rice bowl and use the easy and fun resources to deepen your Lenten experience. Your prayers, fasting, and almsgiving this Lenten season will help Catholic Relief Services continue to provide life-saving assistance in nearly 100 countries. Daylight Savings Time begins next Sunday, so be sure to set your clocks ahead one hour before retiring this coming Saturday so that you won't be late for Mass. Reservations are required to attend weekday and Sunday in-person Masses. Those can still be made on our website, oldstmarys.com, or you can simply call the parish office. Of course, we'll continue to stream uh, through our website, through Facebook, and we'll post uh, all of our Masses up on our YouTube channel. Uh, finally, the Old St. Mary's, we're having this event that's going to be chilly, some chilly cook-off, we haven't given that up, and some trivia, a chilly and trivia night, but it's going to be over Zoom. I know that sounds intriguing, so check this out. It's going to be Saturday, March 20th at 7 p.m. 
Father Brad, our pastor there, is going to be outside in the commons. He'll have a handout for you as well as details on how that's going to work. I think that's going to be a wonderful uh, event and a lot of fun. Uh, We do ask you please remain in your place until the closing hymn concludes. At that point, the ushers will dismiss you row by row. My friends, the Lord be with you. Let us bow down for God's blessing. Direct, O Lord, we pray, the hearts of your faithful, and in your kindness grant your servants this grace, that abiding in the love of you and their neighbor, they may fulfill the whole of your commands. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. this time your word says it can be change our minds this time your life could make us free we are the people your call set apart lord this time change our hearts brought by your hand to the edge of our dreams in paradise one in the waste drawn by your promises still we are lured by the shadows and the chains we leave behind but change our hearts this time your word says it can be change our minds this time your life could make us free We are the people your call set apart, Lord, this time. Change our hearts. Brother Brad gave me the battery at communion time and told me to bring it up to his table. I didn't know what good it was going to do at communion time. Can you? Okay. <laughs>